Okay, uh, uh, hello everybody and thanks very much to Knots for the invitation. Uh, it has been an absolutely fantastic week. Um, and uh, you know, the sheer depth and breadth of information has been absolutely astounding on a daily, daily basis. And uh, especially there with, with John there, John Kemp, uh, really stimulating stuff. And I suppose to begin with, I should apologize because we're going to take a significant nosedive now. Um, but uh, hopefully you will be um, interested in what I have to say. So I'm going to dilute some of this a little bit with uh, water management and looking at biological soil management for water management. So I suppose to begin with, I, I, I know this might seem quite basic, but I think it's worth our while bearing this in mind. The vast majority of the water in the planet is actually salt water. Only 3% is fresh water. And of that 3%, 70% is in polar ice caps or in glaciers, um, you know, uh, on terrestrial zones around the world. 30% is soil moisture or lies in aquifers under our feet. All right, so we're effectively only dealing with 1% of the global water volume in agriculture, okay? And of that 1%, we are the major um, sector that draws down that water. 69% of the fresh offtakes is from agriculture itself. 19% is from industry and 12% from domestic um, dwellings. And... Um, the thing about it is by 2030, 50%, almost 50% of the world's population will live in areas of water stress. Now, with relation to climate and water, approximately 2 billion, 2 billion people are affected by natural disasters. In, this was in the last decade of the 20th century. And the vast majority of these were water related, nearly 90%, over 85%. Climate variability is going to increase the frequency of floods and droughts. And the International Panel on Climate Change, they actually have projections for rising temperatures and sea levels um, in subs with substantial population displacement from 2050, particularly in coastal regions around the world. This is... Um, these are two surfers from Donegal, uh, Conor McClory and Sophie Curran. And uh, they were on the beach in Bloody Foreland about uh, two weeks ago, and they picked up this steel canister. All right. Um, and there was an engraving on the outside. So they went on the Internet to try and see and uh, what the engraving meant. And they were told that it was indeed a time capsule. It contained lots of memorabilia, photographs, beer mats, as it were, uh, and other postcards and other information. Okay. And the origin of the capsule was the North Pole in the Arctic. Okay. Um, from this ice breaking ship, 50 years of victory. And the team of scientists and uh, guest visitors, they actually left the capsule on an ice floe there thinking that it would be 30 to 50 years before it would arrive on land. There was a letter dated in the capsule, and it was the 4th of August, 2018. All right. So what we actually have is we have a situation where within 28 months, a capsule that was on an ice floe in the North Pole is after arriving in Northwest Donegal. Met Aaron have been doing a lot of climate modeling in recent years, and Keith Lampkin is a senior climat climatologist there. And their projections are in Ireland by mid century, we're going to have temperatures on average getting warmer, the growing season will become longer, spring will on average come earlier. But with this warmer air, it's going to hold more moisture. And that means we're going to get more heavy rainfall events. And just as testament to this, um, this is just a graphic of temperature change in Ireland since 1901. And significant increases have been recorded since 
for the last 25 years in actual fact. So the blue bars are where on average it's getting cooler, the red bars are where it's actually getting warmer and the intensity of the red color shows the actual increase. Overall, it's just one degree Celsius over the entire timeline, but it is quite significant. So the interesting thing about it is where do we stand with all of this? Because Richard Fortune, uh, at the beginning of the week, he said he was like a rabbit going down a rabbit hole, but most of us rabbits are actually standing in the glaze of this and we're just wondering, what are we going to do? And farmers are on, in the middle, and on one side, policy is directing them in a certain direction, and then lobbyists are claiming or screaming for them to do something else. So the question is, are we dealing with climate action or climate inaction? All right. And that's a big, big question that we have to answer. This is a topic, a topic graphical photo of Ireland. OK, and um, the, on the left hand side, you can see the mountainous regions are in a, a lighter cream and a gray color. And there's a very good a geographer who's working on the heavy soils program with Chagas Gohan Fenton. And he was showing this one day and he just mentioned that Ireland is actually shaped like a saucer, all right? Because if you look around the coastal regions, it's all mountainous, nearly the majority of the way around its perimeter with a sunken area in the center. On top of that, if you actually look at the right-hand map, you will see all of the water courses around the country. And it just goes to show you the sheer volume and spread of water courses throughout, throughout the actual country itself. And that's from the EPA. So two weeks ago, uh, this is a route that I take to my work at, um, on a daily basis. And two weeks ago, this was a scene that was happening. Uh, it's just one field, okay, it's a cropping field. And the farmer started on the right-hand side of the field and worked his way across, all right? So what you have is you've the green material, which has actually greened up after the harvest just about uh, two, three months ago. And he's after tilling that initially, and then he actually plows this down. So what's happening here is he's moving from a green situation on the left over to a plowed situation on the right with full soil exposure. One week later, the fields look like this. A week later, the fields looks like this, and this is this morning, okay? So what has actually happened here is from a situation where we green cover on a field, we move towards sowing a crop, but we're after exposing soil. And if we go back to this scene again, on the left-hand side, we had this green cover, then we actually tilled it, then we plowed it down, and we end up with that uh, wet area right around the center of the field itself. But in actual fact, in a biological system, what we're doing is we're moving from the left-hand side over to the right-hand side. We're trying to cover the soil. And it's very, very important. But this is not just confined to arable cropping. Very often in our crop or in our grassland systems, particularly with intensive grazing, we actually graze swords very, very tightly in this country. And sometimes that means that we can actually expose quite an amount of soil underneath the plant itself or what we leave in terms of the residue of the plant. And that actually stops root growth. And you can see on the right hand side, the length of time it takes for the roots biomass to actually recover when you actually cut it down relatively shortly, uh, as you would in an intensive grazing situation. And then, of course, we have the situation where we actually leave animals out on tightly grazed pasture when conditions are less than ideal. And again, we expose some soil. The problem with soil exposure in a wet climate like we have is its exposure to rainfall. All right. And we don't fully appreciate it, but there is an explosion that happens every time a raindrop hits the surface of the ground and if it's soil to the surface of the soil itself and on the right hand side is a schematic of how that raindrop bursts apart but the sheer impact actually has a compacting effect 
of the water on top of the soil, leading to a compacting effect on the surface of the soil, and we call this surface capping. And just to explain this a little bit further, on the left, where we actually leave the soil covered, all right, and we don't disturb the soil, we allow soil aggregates to bind and adhere together. Joel Williams explained this earlier on in the week, and also Christine Jones on the first day, about you know, this adherence, these adhering properties that are there when we've got active microbiology in the soil. And the glomulin that's sometimes used is actually binding various soil particles together. But on top of that, as well as larger aggregates, we're leaving a cover on top of the ground. So what we do is we actually get infiltration and we get movement down through the profile. On the right hand side, when we actually disturb soil and intensively cultivate it, what we're doing is we're breaking those aggregates apart. And this has a net effect of creating small particles up near the soil surface. And these are particularly susceptible to this compacting effect of rainfall. So when we get this capping, we get movement across the surface, leading to runoff and leading to flooding. And we don't get infiltration and percolation down through the soil profile. Just to add this a little bit further, all right, these are two soil samples. This is a slate test. And on the left-hand side, you've got conservation agriculture with very little soil disturbance. And on the right side, you've got plow-based tillage. And you can see the effect that this aggregation has in terms of the stability of the soil when totally immersed in water. Whereas on the right-hand side, the soil shatters and falls apart. And this has a major implication for a lot of things that we're trying to deal with now as a general society. On the bottom left-hand corner is a town near where I live in Clamel, and this is the Davis Road. Um, and this is about 10, 15 years ago, actually, when it was completely flooded. It's about 700 meters from the Shore River. But, and all of the press and media attention is on that bottom left-hand picture, all right? But when you leave that area and you move up the catchment, you find that water is actually coming across land, all right? It's actually causing... Uh, surface runoff onto roadways or maybe into dikes at the sides of roads and consequently into other streams. It's causing rilling in fields on the top of the right, and you've just got general overland flow on the top of the left. So we're moving from the top of the left as we move down the catchment the whole way down along, and what's happening is water is hitting main river channels at an accelerated speed. Of course, back on farmland, they have to deal with this as well because we can get these intensive bursts, what we call spade flooding. And the sheer power of this, I mean, this slide here shows a conservation effort to stop um, you know, sediment loss into the river. You can see it in the bottom of the uh, picture. But the sheer force of the river is actually after undermining the entire riverbank up very high, and it's now eating into farmer land. And of course, then when we get to low-lying areas in the middle of the country, and particularly along our rain river, river system like the Shannon, we have these callow lands and floodplains which get frequently flooded. Now, one of the solutions that's proposed is that we do dredging in certain situations, but they are very much location-specific, and very often you need a better gradient or a better fall than we have in the Shannon network for this to be successful. The other thing is with dredging, we can cause a lot of ecological damage. So really what we want to try and do in terms of water management is to keep water on land as much as we possibly can. In other words, in situ where the raindrop falls. So on top of this, we have an issue with relation to the loss of nutrients to waterways, okay? And it can come from two situations. On the left-hand side, we actually have nitrate levels, and you can see that they're more or less condensed towards the eastern and southeastern, down to the southwestern part of the country. And on the right is phosphorus levels, 
which largely follow the same pattern itself. But a lot of this movement is due to this movement of water from land into water courses and down into catchments. Now, it's not the only reason. There are other reasons in terms of poor water treatment facilities around the country and then inadequate water treatment facilities that need upgrade as well. But this is where some of the higher readings are being observed around the country. I just saw this last week and it's very, very interesting because LIDAR radar has now been used to actually survey the topography of land to look at biomass in terms of biomass vegetation over the ground, but also to look at the potential for overland flow um, both of soil, water, and contained nutrients. So this was actually advertised just a, a couple of weeks ago, and it's you know a tender, and they're looking for um, the conduction of an aerial LIDAR survey that takes 25 scans per meter squared, and to use that data then to actually assess the above-ground biomass to assess car the carbon sequestered, hydrogeology analysis to show overland flow of soil and nutrients, and then to show the size of each watershed and the associated ground cover. In 1995, I was working in Africa, and at the time at home, we had to get a, a well drilled, a private well, because we're living in a rural area. So the well that was drilled was 70 feet deep. And I only bring this up now because it's quite topical and it's topical certainly at home because just in the last couple of months, we had to get a well drilled at home as well. So just 100 metres away in a second field, in 2020, we had to go down 210 feet to actually hit an adequate supply of water. But interestingly, the man drilling the well had told me that increasingly a significant part of his work, and he's overloaded with work, is to actually deepen wells in different locations around the country, including on farms. So we're actually losing water off the surface of our land in Ireland, and we're also now beginning to see the effect of that in terms of lowering water levels in groundwater. We had a drought in 2018, and I just want to show you this to show you the effect of drought on some of the grass type system that we have so the darker colored vegetation in this field is all perennial ryegrass. And before 2018, it was all like that. It was all perennial ryegrass. The lighter green colors are creeping softgrass, annual meadowgrass, Yorkshire fog, rough and smooth stalk meadowgrass. So we're actually have and using a grass model that is actually quite susceptible to these fluctuations in terms of weather conditions and weather patterns. So in terms of biological farming, what we're trying to do is we are trying to use these natural processes as efficiently as we possibly can. The first one is photosynthesis. The second one is the carbon cycle, and we can add the mineral cycle to that as well. And the third one is the water cycle. Our conventional model in Europe now is such that we are one of the highest users of energy in agricultural production globally. All right. This is statistics from the FAO and the United Nations Environment Programme back from 2011, 2012, and I venture that things haven't changed much in the meantime. But we're using a significant amount of energy for food production in these darker regions around the globe. And in Asia and Indonesia, for example, those darker regions, they're associated with both fertilization, but also with the cost of irrigation. But what we're seeing is across greater European Union, we have a very high input or high energy demand agricultural production model. So Greg Judy, when he was with us on Tuesday, he actually said photosynthesis is free. It's a free source of energy. He said, can you find anything cheaper than free? So the question is, how are we utilizing photosynthesis? And John Kemp is just after going through a significant description 
about that and how we are not using it optimally. So with all this rainfall that we're getting and increased bursts of heavy rainfall predicted in the coming years, are we actually using this effectively either as part of the water cycle? Because we've got two types of rainfall. We've got non-effective rainfall and we've effective rainfall. And we had a lot of rainfall in the last two days. So which category is it falling into? And a lot of that is based around the stewardship, all right? Gabe Brown mentioned that nature cycles water very, very efficiently, okay? It's our stewardship and our stewardship of the land that actually affects that uh, whole cycle and that whole cycle process. So the question is, are we actually using what we're getting effectively? So what can you do? We don't realize this, but of course, the first thing you need is accurate information. We've been talking about this all week, and this is why a lot of us are tuning into knots. Uh, right throughout since Monday through to today. And we don't, I think, fully appreciate the wonderful services and the wonderful resource that Met Aaron is, but we've got 508 uh, weather stations, official weather stations, right throughout the country. All right. And I just picked out one of them here because of knots and where this conference has been headquartered this week, which is in Drumshambo. But they have had an official weather recording station there going back to 1893. So wherever you're located in the country, and whether you're a dry stock farmer, dairy farmer, a cropping farmer, a horticulture producer, you can get a very accurate guide to the amount of rainfall that's after falling on a monthly or daily basis in your direct catchment area. And that's a very, I'd say practical place to start. In terms of harnessing that water, in terms of using photosynthesis, one of the things we can do is we can use plants that are beneficial for both using photosynthesis and absorbing water. And the deep-rooted varieties are excellent at this. So this uh, slide is from Cotswold Seeds, this infographic. But I mean, you can actually see across the range of different plants from the legumes, right across to the grasses, the difference in terms of root system, root biomass and root structure. And even if you compare a grass on the right-hand side, like Coxfoot tree in from the right, and you compare that with perennial ryegrass and Westerwolds, you can see it's got a far bigger and more dense biomass and root system compared with perennial ryegrass or even Westerwolds for that matter. In arable systems over in the UK, this is a farmer down in Suffolk, uh, uh, John Pawsey, and he's experimenting with something that Tom Fuhi was talking about yesterday, which is the use of clover in the interrow space between um, your cereal grains, okay? And that's at an early stage in terms of development, but in actual fact, if we can modify this and use this approach well, we could have in situ a nitrogen fixing plant helping a growing crop um, that is either side of it, all right? I remember years ago down in South America, they were actually doing something like this where they were at sowing vetches and wheat seed with the same drill in this, on the same day and they were leaving it as the major um, source of nutrient for the growing season ahead. a few years back, but we let the farmers do exactly what they were doing. And all we got them to do was not even with residue, but we actually cut grass from the surrounding bush. And we covered the interrow space with the grass at this demonstration site. And it proved enormously effective. But interestingly, when we were interviewing the participants in the program towards the end of the growing season, there were differences on a gender basis between what they perceived were the benefits associated with this. The male farmers were delighted that this mulch cover was actually leaving the maize plants and the bean plants deal with some of these 
short dry spells during this longer drying season, okay, our longer rainy season, where we are getting these sporadic arrival of rains rather than these continuous rains on a daily basis. And they were delighted with that, how it was able to keep the various crops growing. The women, on the other hand, were delighted because this significantly cut down on the amount of weeding that they had to do. And it's a very simple principle. Gabe Brown was saying, armor your soil, armor your soil. So when you do that, and this is back in Ireland, if you leave residue on top of soil and you just scrape it back, this is what lies beneath on the left, on the top of the left, whereas in the bottom of the right, that's exposed soil. But on the top of the left, look, you can see some of the residue already beginning to be decomposed. And you can even see some earthworm pasts underneath the residue showing you that there's biological activity. Whereas our soil that wasn't covered is now becoming cloddy and desiccated and is going to be increasingly difficult to deal with. And that, those earthworms, they're a vital keystone species in a healthy, active biological soil. And we just identify these as earthworms, but specifically they're divided into three categories. We've got surface worms called epigeic worms. We've got endogeic worms that work in the top 15 centimeters of the soil, and you find those in most agronomic systems. But it's the deep burrowers on the right-hand side that are really, really important in terms of managing soil. Charles Darwin called these naked worms, earthworms, or called them the earth's plowmen. So these species on the right are really, really important for sustainable productive systems. And this is a bit of daikon radish, and you can see how these earthworms, and they're all naked species, are absolutely loving this. And there are 18 of them feasting on this, on the top of the soil. So we actually, if we keep armor on the soil and residue on the soil, this is where they actually come to feed, particularly at nighttime. I had a student a couple of years ago, a very good student, Lisa O'Toole, and what we did was we actually took a section of ground that Damien Fuhr in Chagas in Kildalton had set aside for no tillage and no tillage systems and treatments. And we've been doing it for about three years now. But even in the no-tillage soil, what we did was we actually harvested earthworm casts from the surface of the ground. And what we did was we actually then did a sample of the underlying soil and we analyzed this across a variety of parameters. But most interestingly, we found higher calcium, higher magnesium, higher copper, higher manganese, higher zinc in the earthworm casts. So here we have a biological species delivering a nutritional benefit to our soil and improving soil fertility. Infinity water in the UK are so taken by this approach now that they're becoming very active in supporting farmers and supporting events that actually look, that look towards using biological type systems. Um, and they're very active, for example, in the groundswell um, event over in the UK. And it's very interesting because this is one of the slides that they use in their promotional material where they actually have the residue and where they have the cover to protect the soil. It's up near the surface. And of course, as well as that, we can build upwards as well in terms of changing biomass and changing vegetation and protecting our lands as well. And this is in France where they're establishing a new hedgerow. And unlike ourselves, what they're doing here is they're establishing a double hedgerow and they leave a little corridor in between for mammals and birds and wild animals to actually run up and down to provide a nature corridor. And it's very much appreciated by the hunting fraternity as well for game. And again, in the south of France, this is down in the Midi Pyrenees. I just came across this farmer, this arable farmer, and he was introducing trees into his own landscape, but he was doing so strategically, okay, so he could actually go through his crop with his machinery, and he has the added benefit now of having these trees to provide shade during very warm conditions, um, a bit of shelter if there is very intense rainfall conditions, 
And they're all deciduous trees, so the leaves return organic matter back to the soil. And then in terms of pure forestry itself, we often look at plantation forestry as being a great carbon sequesterer, but sometimes that depends on the soil that you're dealing with. This is a paper that was just published this year by Nina Friggins, and what she's looking at is she's looking at carbon stocks and carbon storage in different types of situations in blanket bog and moorland over in Scotland. And it's very interesting what she found because she has got greater carbon content in your natural vegetation habitat, which is bellheader, right? Compared with pine cover, compared with birch cover. And as well as that, when you compare carbon dioxide respiration, which happens naturally, she also found that again, heather actually released less carbon dioxide to the atmosphere compared with the birch, compared with the pine. So very often we have to choose the right plant, even if it's a tree in the right place. And it was the central message of what Jim McAdam was saying yesterday evening. And this is where it can go wrong. Okay, maybe the wrong plant in the wrong place particularly in view of these heavy rainfall events that we're actually having. And we need to take stock of this, not just from a farming or agricultural point of view or a forestry point of view, but we need to take stock of it as a society as well. I just put this in because I, I was just intrigued by it because we had very uh, intense uh, wildfires over in the United States just in the last few months. We had them in across Australia earlier on in the year. But I just saw this picture in National Geographic, and it was a little valley that was protected from the ravages of the wildfires in Idaho, in a place called Bow Creek. And would you believe it, that valley was saved because of beaver activity in that area. It's the direct result of a beaver dam. So Gabe Brown says, nature cycles water very efficiently. It knows what to do. And sometimes we need to just observe it a little bit more and mirror exactly what is happening in our agronomic systems. So in terms of water use efficiency, we have different losses, evaporation, overland flow, surface water runoff and transpiration. And we can see with evaporation, we're losing a lot more in conventional agriculture systems and models that we're using. Overland flow, we're losing more water because of the exposure of the soil and not having adequate vegetation cover. We're getting significantly more surface water runoff compared with a biological agriculture model because what's actually happening is we are getting increased overland flow and that means we're getting the runoff into dikes, into drains and into water courses. The one area where there's increased loss of water in biological agriculture is through transpiration, natural transpiration. And that's because we've more plants on the soil surface. Um, so they're releasing a little bit more water into the atmosphere. And in terms of gains, we've got biopores. So these larger soil aggregates and the associated pores in the soil are significantly greater in biological agriculture. Infiltration is significantly greater in biological agriculture. And because of that, available water is better and more available to the plants that are growing so we don't suffer as much in drought conditions. And water storage, percolation into the groundwater body is also improved significantly as a result. And we get movement and filtration of water down through the soil profile to give us clean, potable groundwater. This is a, an image that uh, the Knotts team actually had up at Biofarm in 2019, all right? And it's a schematic from the Natural Resource Conservation Service in the United States. We've mentioned it in passing a number of times in the past week with relation to the soil food web. And we've looked at various aspects, particularly on the left-hand side with relation to microorganisms and bacteria and fungi and protozoa. But I want you to look at the extreme left because it's a fantastic summary of what's involved in these processes. 
in regenerative agriculture. Because what we're doing is we're growing plants with living roots and shoots. And we're also leaving residue or organic material on the soil surface. And this is decomposed and acted on by these microorganisms. But that's not where it ends, because these are being predators on. Okay? I think Greg Judy said it should be carnage under your feet in an active, healthy soil. Absolute carnage. So what happens is protozoa feed on bacteria, nematodes feed on both hyphae, protozoa and bacteria, other nematodes feed on those nematodes, and then we've got shredders and arthropods that work on you know, the decomposing organic material as well as you know, the third trophic level that break down this organic material. But then on the right-hand side, what we have is we've got greater biodiversity, what we call terrestrial biodiversity. So in, with relation to plant residues, and I think it's an important point because, you know, there is a proposal that we're going to return straw to land. But those birds that we're often trying to include in agri-environmental schemes include ground nesting birds, the lapwing, the gray partridge, and the skylark, and they like to have um, organic material and straw on the soil surface for their own personal habitats. We have seed and insect eating birds like buntings, finish, finches, linnet, the yellow hammer, even the stock dove, and these appreciate the seed that are left on the surface if we don't actually disturb soil too much or do too much movement of the residue on the surface. That bird on the left-hand side with its mouth open on top of an ear of wheat, that's now extinct in Ireland. And of course, then we've got carnivorous birds like the hen harrier and the sparrow hawk. The hen harrier feeds on mice and voles that will be present in the actual um, on the surface, feeding on seeds in the fields that we have. And the sparrowhawk actually feeds on some of those smaller birds as part of its habitat. So the point is burying residue, it actually destroys habitats and food sources for all of these birds. And the vast majority of them were trying to mine and save in agri-environmental schemes. The point about all of this and to put it into the context of climate and changeable climate is that forests and agriculture, and this is under United Nations Environmental Programme Analysis, they constitute 30% of the solution to climate change. Yet at present, they're only receiving 3% of climate financing around the globe. So we have a major solution to climate but we're not actually putting enough resources into optimizing that solution in different countries around the world. So water management in biological agriculture, what do we need to do? The most important thing we need to do is we need to capture water in situ. It was one of the things that Christopher Cook of 3LM said to us the other evening. We need to stabilize and cover soils. Armor your soils, like Gabe Brown was saying. Enhance with diverse plant species and residues. And this was the central tenet of what every speaker was talking about all week long. Use all of your land for strategic water storage. You know, not necessarily dikes and gullies, or maybe to create a wet area, we can actually store water across all of our land by doing things a little bit differently. And then, as Dr. Jim McAdam was saying, integrate trees into the farm, the right tree in the right place. And I suppose for horticulture growers, go back and look at local records because you are getting this free resource of rain from the sky, and this can help you with irrigation for horticulture systems, be they for your own use, but also if you're in commercial horticulture as well. And I think from that point of view about the United Nations Environment Programme, it's now about time that we seriously reward farmers and growers financially for the efforts that they make in terms of doing this. Quite cynically, you know, some people in Brussels 
they might say, well, if it's better for the farmer to do it, why do they need to be subsidized? The point about it is that so much of what's happening at the moment is pointing us in a different type of direction. So, food for thought. I was talking about Christopher Cook there and I was laughing because that was Wednesday evening and he showed at the end of his presentation, he showed um, an article about the Irish from the Irish Times um, about Ireland being third in the world for quality of life. Well, after day two, on the second day, and the first day with Christine Jones and David Wallace and Alan Savory and uh, um, the Danu group and Greg Judy and Richard Perkins and the base group and Jim Cronin and Joel Williams to say nothing about Bruno Follador, I opened the Irish Times on Tuesday and this is what I saw. And I could so much associate with what Michael Harding was saying. I used to be so smart. Now I'm a complete gobshite. So after all of these wonderful presentations from scientists, from farmers all week, I think we've got an awful lot of food for thought and maybe we need to embrace the notion or the concept, you know, that we're not as smart as we'd like to think we are. Um, Louis Macaulay, he actually said something very pertinent about biological agriculture and sustainable agriculture. What he said was, you're embarking on a journey. There's no arrival. It's a constant journey. Thank you. Okay, uh, well done, uh, John. Um, I, I, I have to say, I was really taken by that um, statistic of that 30% Farmers will be responsible for 30% of the solution to climate change, but they're only getting 3% of the funding. Can you expand a little bit where those numbers came from? I think a lot of it has them to do from with Michael which... Harding. Mm, what's that? <laughs> I hope you didn't rob them from Michael Harding. No, I did. No, I did not. No. I think a lot of the solution lies in something we were talking about earlier in the week and Gabe Brown mentioned it, and that was to do with carbon and carbon sequestration, because we're looking at agriculture as a source of carbon. What the United Nations Environment Programme we're looking at was looking at agriculture as a net sink for carbon and a potential net sink for carbon. But it's very dangerous for us to be kind of expecting that there is going to be some type of a carbon credit model or a carbon credit system in place, because I mean, Gabe, I think he mentioned a figure of $170,000 studying this on his own farm and that no accurate levels were found across the entire area that they were studying, you know. So I think as against that, you have to be pragmatic about this and the European Union are going to have to be pragmatic about it. In Canada, what they did when they set up a carbon credit system in Alberta was they looked at the available science from their own region. And what they did was they took a weighted average of the amount of carbon sequestered per year. And then what they did was they based a payment between private players and farmers on that basis. And actually some of the proposals that have gone into the European Union have used that average weighted model, you know, as being a proposal of what could be done if we went in a specific way. But I mean, if you think about it logically, at the moment, we're only experimenting uh, with, you know, different measures in agri schemes. Okay, we're not necessarily encouraging significant uptake, and to do that, I think we will really need to reward farmers to a greater extent. But you know than what we're doing at the moment. Yeah, you, you mentioned there the the idea that if farmers getting excited about carbon credits would be a dangerous one. Why do you say that? Well, I. To be honest about it, Dara, I've been a, a long time on the road with relation to conservation agriculture, you know. I mean, going back into the 90s, and I came back to Ireland in early 2000. And, you know, I've worked with farmers um, in a lot of different countries along that road and that journey myself. And I've met five ministers for agriculture, three presidents. I've met two European commissioners for agriculture, several different officials in Brussels. 
since 2000 and are always saying to you, oh, we're going to do something about this and something in this regard. And really and truly, I think the first move in this direction was the introduction of a well-supported scheme on cover crops in Gloss in 2015. Now, if it took us that long to recognize the benefits and the importance of cover crops, you know, I just wonder how long will it take before people agree to a model or a calculation factor or an interpretive factor for fixing or sequestering carbon in the ground. And the other thing I suppose we should kind of consider as well is, is that the motivation why you would do something? To be chasing a credit or chasing a subsidy or chasing a payment? I mean, we all are experiencing problems on our farmland. And surely the motivation that we should be looking towards is actually trying to improve our own situation on our farms ourselves. If a credit system comes, if a subsidy system comes, that's an added bonus. But you have to mind your own patch, so to speak. Sure, but against that, like, isn't it the surefire way to get wholesale change in a sector? If you plug it into a scheme and reward farmers for something, they they engage and gloss and reps and all the rest of them are perfect examples of that they are but you know it, it very much depends on the measure and how it's actually used and supported remember cover crops were supported since reps three you know you're going back to 2006 they were supported in reps four they were supported in eos one two and three and really and truly i would say that there was a Department of Agricultural official called Niall Ryan from Wexford. And I'd say without him, you probably wouldn't have had as, you know, I think as strong a payment for cover crops or introducing cover crops without his insistence with his peers and at European level as well uh, with the commission officials that this was a good and necessary thing to do. And the proof of the pudding is in the, is in the eating, Dara. You're exactly correct. Because in those earlier schemes, the, the maximum uptake on cover crops was 1,000 hectares, right? Gloss came in, and as of last year, we had 23,000 hectares of cover crops been grown in Ireland. So it just is, it's total evidence that if you support, if you support farmers in the right way, you will get the necessary change and you will get the role and benefit. Just when you are uh, majoring on cover crops there, is there any empirical evidence showing um, the, the environmental benefits of cover crops in terms of less uh, water runoff or less nutrient loss? Has, has any, has, are the powers that be doing any studies to quantify the benefits yet, do you know? Uh, well, actually, you know, Chagas have data going back to 2000 and, you know, the early 2000s, actually, they looked at cover crops um, and they looked at them in spring barley systems. But what they did was they looked at cover crops. We, I mean, we've been talking about mixtures all, all week here in terms of biological farming. But a lot of the research that has been done in Ireland has been based on single species. But even at that, um, there was a study done by Hooker um, in... Uh, Hooker et al. in 2005 or six, which was looking at the contribution of different species where they looked at phacelia, they looked at oats, and they looked at mustard, all right? And they compared them in plow-based versus minimum tillage and no cover and cover crop cover, okay? But between the worst and the best, and the best was minimum tillage with, with cover crops, um, believe it or not, when you went into the calculations of it, the mustard cover crop is hoovered up the equivalent of two bags of can calcium ammonium nitrate over the winter period compared with the worst treatment, all right, which was no cover and plow based. So, and by the way, this has been substantiated further in different research papers, not just in Ireland, but in Denmark, which would have, you know, a wet type climate as well and they're very serious about the environmental issue over there. They don't allow their farmers, for example, to grow legumes um, in cover cropping, which we do here. So the information, the research information is there. And um, I think in many respects, it's a little bit outdated, 
Sometimes the design isn't great, but I think there's enough evidence there to show the guaranteed benefits of doing certain practices. Cover cropping is one, diverse rotations is another. Mixed species swords, we had Helen Sheridan last year, we had Dr. Fiona Brennan uh, just yesterday actually talking about the benefits of these. I mean, these are no brainers and you know, they should be part and parcel of any uh, eco scheme. Should they be part and parcel? Should they be obligatory whether you're in the scheme or not, I wonder? I mean, it, uh, what, what the, I'm thinking, listen to you, is if we have cover crops now in 23,000 acres, I think you said. Um, hectares. Hectares, better again. Um, and you multiply up all that can that it's locking up, and you put that side by side with the, the maps that you're showing where we do have this this nutrient loss issue in the, in the most intensely farmed parts of Ireland, um, do we need to make cover crops and some of those types of measures even more broadly adopted, more, uh, um, uh, more a non-negotiable? We probably, we should and we possibly could, but I suppose there's an imperative there that very often the powers that be and the uh, public officials and representatives, they always look for this thing called evidence. So you're caught, in a, you're caught in a bind, Dara, you know? So you need to do research to get the evidence, all right? Sometimes the research isn't necessarily the type of design or the type of way or the type of format that a farmer would do, you know, the practice on the ground, uh, or isn't possibly the way that the farmer would actually design the research themselves. So. And then you've got this time lag because usually these research assessments are done over the period of a master's degree or a PhD study, you know. And I remember years ago, I was talking to a, a farmer down in, and he was a scientist as well, uh, Victor Trigo uh, in Argentina. And I was talking about, you know, how far behind we had fallen in the European context, but also in the Irish context. And I said to him, we need to do an awful lot of research. And he said to me, no, you don't, John. You don't, he said, this works. We know it works. He said, spend your money judiciously on encouraging farmers to do the practice. And he said, do your monitoring if you want to then and do your evaluating and get your data, but don't waste too much money reinventing the wheel. And I think it was very prescient advice at the time. And it's something that I would like to see happen. Indeed, it is happening to an extent. I mean, you look at the excellent work David Wallace presented on Monday in the Daniel Group. And the work then that's been done on the ground in base Ireland, you know, um, I just think we need to see more of that and we need to see more support at farmer level. Okay. Sean, you want to jump in Yeah, there. I just want to say very quickly because we have a huge amount of questions to get through. But John, Gabe Brown did mention this as well in our earlier discussions that, you know, and you said there, it's, it, is it a bit of a folly to chase, uh, to chase carbon credits? Because... It's almost like what Louis McCullough said, it's well down the journey, isn't it? Uh, you know, there's certain benefits that come much quicker, uh, like biodiversity, like other benefits that ultimately will lead to carbon sequestration that will are actually much easier to measure. Quite possibly, Sean. Well, I think uh, there's probably greater agreement, let's say, around the research establishment and the academic establishment on measurement than there would be with relation to carbon and carbon sequestration. And what level to take the carbon at? Do you do it at the zero to 10 centimeters or the zero, 10 to 30 centimeters or 30 centimeters or below? But like, I mean, we just see, and I mean, this week has highlighted it, the evidence that's coming through that, you know, you put these deep rooted plants these deep rooted plants into the ground and the, that's where you get the benefit in terms of extra carbon, you know? So I think that's what we should be looking towards. Okay, okay. Um, we, we, we have a skeptic in our midst, uh, an anonymous question here. Do trees in a wheat field really make a better margin per hectare? And I must admit, similar questions have going through my head. <laughs> I, listen, I just showed it as an example of what's actually happening in, in other countries. Who said you had to put them in the center of the field or in an alleyway like what's been done? Or John Brennan mentioned Wakelands yesterday and the work of Martin Wolf over there, you know, where he did these alleys of trees between his arable crops. 
all right? Who says you have to do them like that? You can actually do them, um, you know, you can build up corners. Very often, there are our machines, we can't get them into the corners of fields. So we can build up corners with trees. We can actually do them along margins. We can do them near headland areas, right, where we're going to be doing quite a bit of trafficking, particularly when we come to harvest time. And the roots of the tree actually add an extra level of stability to that headland area. So there are lots of different things that we can do. I suppose, in a sense, I'd nearly be, uh, you know, cautious like uh, the questioner in the sense that, Jesus, I'm nearly sorry I showed the picture now. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, if there's any department official watching this, please, I am not suggesting that we grow alleys of trees and in cereal fields around the country. Yeah. But what it does highlight is the need for flexibility. I mean, we talk about agroforestry, and I know Ian Short and Chagask and Jim McAdam, they've been talking about agroforestry. They've been doing a lot of work and practical work in terms of research and extension on, agro and on agroforestry for a long period of time, and they couldn't get any traction or interest from on high. So now that there is that level of interest, and I think the signs of a further commitment towards this, I think what's really important is there is an element of flexibility in whatever is introduced, both in terms of placement and also in terms of, for example, integrating it, not just with agricultural production as is in situ, but also with other schemes that farmers might be in actively engaged in. So they wouldn't foot the loss of payments in those particular areas. Like for example, there's a very bright individual up there in Sligo that actually planted trees on his farm, but he had to, you know, put in deductions on his basic payment application for these particular areas. Like that makes no coherent sense at all whatsoever. In other it's words, really he, he was going to lose mm -hmm. payments, uh, some of his entitlements because for the areas that were under trees, if he didn't yeah. do so? You know? Bananas. Yeah. Okay, uh, I've got a question here from Edward. We're going to move along fairly lively now, uh, John, because we are up against the clock. Uh, Edward says, trees are very good at taking up and exhaling water and very good at photosynthesis and adding nutrients to soil. Uh, therefore, is agroforestry a possible solution? I think, yes. Yeah. It's, it, uh, I, look, Dara, you know, We've been, we've been looking at a lot of different things this week and people can get very confused. And like Louis McCauley says, you're starting out on a journey, all right? What you have is you've got a ba basket of options, all right? It's not that we need to be prescriptive. We need to have options to allow farmers to choose what actually might work for themselves. And I think that's the best type of policy that we can put in place. Another question here about um, palatability. I guess this is referring to uh, ryegrass swords. I've heard that um, varieties other than perennial ryegrass are not so tasty to the cow. Can you elaborate? Well, look, it's not something that I have studied to um, any in-depth level, but I can tell you, for example, even in terms of what, talking, and observing and listening to farmers on the ground. I mean, John McHugh there in Leash, he thinks Coxfoot is a vastly underrated grass. And he, you know, when he leaves his cows out into a paddock and you know, he's got tall grass in some of his paddocks, that the first thing that the cows do is they strip the Coxfoot, the, the, the ear and the seed head of the Coxfoot off the plant before they even go and look for any of the leafy material that might be lying underneath in the in, 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 in the vegetation underneath. And George Keane, Jesus, when I think about it, George Keane going back to the 1980s, he did studies on ryegrass and he used what we would consider to be a useless grass, rough stock meadowgrass. Okay, he used rough stock meadowgrass with ryegrass, and he actually had different proportions of each grass in a sword. His optimum dry matter output and his optimum, optimum dry matter digestibility, it actually came out where the ryegrass was at 55% and the rough stock meadowgrass was at 45% in the mix. The ryegrass on its own didn't even out yield the mix of the two grasses. Okay. You know, okay. so it was quite think, significant. I think Dr. Christian Jones said yesterday that they, I know, was it in Australia where 
those ryegrass swards alongside uh, mixed species that the cattle, dairy cows broke down the fence to get into the mixed species. Okay. So a, a palatability mightn't be a big issue. You've got more questions there, Sean, have you? I do. Uh, John, this is, I suppose, an observation as much as anything else uh, from Sam Dean. Instead of dredging, if we let Borden Amona bogs flood, would it be better for water management in the Shannon? Have you any comment to make? Well, I think that's above all our pay grades, yeah. really, uh, for, for, for sure. You know, I mean, the rewetting of bogs, and we actually have the evidence. We've got, we've got peatland conservation projects in different locations around the country, and the... The benefits, the environmental benefits, are really, really significant. And in fairness to them, I think Board Mona are actually looking at different ways of uh, creating, um, you know, valuable output from integrating water into peatlands. Okay, in terms of, for example, um, fish farming. Okay, uh, in terms of uh, growing separate uh, uh, species and harnessing uh, juices off those. So, you know, ideally, yeah, we'd like to see more of that happening. And I think it would be good for ourselves, for the country as well. And also in terms of our uh, carbon audits that are coming down the road, mm -hmm. to actually see something like that. Uh, a question here from Anonymous. Uh, hopefully they're not gonna hack us uh, after we give them the answer. We better give them the right answer, John. <laughs> Um, what are your thoughts on outwintering cattle on cover crops? Is this bad for exposing soil considering the wet winters here? I guess it's a question of how you manage the grazing, is it? I think it is. It's a question of how you manage the grazing. And I think you also have to be pragmatic. Sometimes we're inclined to think that farmers are, in the words of Michael Hard and gobshites, they're far from it, you know, because... Really and truly, I mean, is anybody going to leave stock on a, a cover crop that's just actually churning up mud? Okay, and I know I've seen situations where it can actually, um, it can happen. For example, in kale, and but I think farmers, when they were starting initially, they were just getting used to that practice. What I've seen now in recent years is they move the stock very, very frequently, and if it's too wet, you just take them off. And the other thing, by the way, and which is important. It's the weight of the animal. You know, the weight of the animal, the size of the animal is going to cause the difficulty or the compaction. You really don't have an issue with something like store lambs or hoggets. You don't have an issue with wanelings because they're lighter in terms of frame and in terms of size. Like a lot of things in nature, it all comes down to a pretty a fine balance. Uh, John Garrity, thanks so much for your time and your wonderful uh, presentation.